Hello and welcome. We're going to be bringing back these training videos and we're going to be updating frequently. So make sure you check back in, subscribe so you can get notifications. My name is Costa and I'm going to be your F5 expert for today. In this video, we're going to break down what a pool member is, how it differs from a node, and then we're also going to take a look at the different states that a pool member can be in on the F5. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we have our GUI up. We have it accessible. Let's go ahead and navigate to where pool members or pools are present on the GUI. So I'm gonna go under local traffic and click the pools. And I'll see that I have both my production and my test pools. Before I go any further though, let's define what a pool member is. So according to F5's definition, a pool member is a logical object that represents a physical node on the network. Now what they mean by physical node is just an IP address. Because you can have a virtual machine as well as a physical device that's configured as a pool member taking traffic on the F5. Now one common question that I get is what's the difference between a node and a pool member? Let's start and take a look at the nodes tab. And we'll kind of build out on that definition. Now when I open up the nodes tab, I'll see that I have a name and an IP address. And it's important to understand that the name is really a name that I as the administrator will configure. Now that could be a host name or it could just be a friendly name that helps me identify the system and its purpose. And then the address is manually entered as well. So a node is just a name or an IP address. You don't necessarily need a name, but the IP address is mandatory. Now if I go to the pools tab and let's take a look at production, you'll notice kind of the same information is there. I've got my name, which is derived from the node. I've got the IP address, but one last bit of information that wasn't in the nodes tab is now I have a socket associated. So it's important to understand that a node is going to be the IP address of the system, but a pool member is going to be that same IP as well as the socket. And that is what tells the load balancer what port traffic is going to be load balanced to. So now that we've got pool members and nodes defined, let's go ahead and move on to the states that a pool member can be configured. So I'm gonna open up my production pool, go on to the members tab. You can see we've got kind of a high overview on the members that are present, the IP address that they're associated with, as well as the TCP port or UDP port. So let's go ahead and open Web01. Now within here, we can see a ton of good information. Um, we can see the node name, we can see the IP address. You can also see the socket that is bound to this pool member. But we wanna, we wanna go ahead and move our attention down to the state field. Got some good information here. So we can see that there's three states for this pool member that we can go ahead and configure. So let's start off by defining what the enabled state is. Now enabled, as far as the F5 is concerned, means that this server is ready, it's configured correctly, and can accept incoming user requests. Now by default, if I add a pool member to this pool, it will be added as enabled. There is a caveat there that if I have any assigned health monitor, the F5 is going to let the health monitor run its course. And if it passes or fails, we'll actually determine the state of the pool member. But by default, without a health monitor, if I place a pool member into this pool, the F5 market is enabled, meaning that user requests will be load balanced to the server. So now that we've defined enabled, let's go ahead and move on to our second option, which is disabled. 
Now, when I place this server into a disabled state, no changes have actually been made until I actually click the update button. So keep that in mind. Now, if we look to the, to the right of the uh, actual state, we'll get a brief description which details that only persistent or active connections are allowed. Now, if we take a look at that into further detail, an active connection is going to be different from a brand new connection, which is also going to be different from a persistent connection. So let's break down each of those connections that we can use throughout this video. Now, a brand new connection is going to be that your user types in his or her browser www.example.com. That traffic reaches this load balancer and the load balancer is going to evaluate the pool members that are present within that pool. If your server is in a disabled state, the load balancer will not consider in our, in our example, Web01 as a valid pool member to forward those requests onto. So that is a brand new connection that has not been established or does not have a persistence record. Now an active connection is different in the sense that that connection has already established on the F5. It has been load balanced to Web01 and that two-way communication is ongoing if I place this server into a disabled state, the F5 will continue to forward requests that are already landed on Web01 until they have completed. And the last situation would be a persistent connection, which means that your user may not be actively browsing the website but due to persistence on the F5, which can be further explained in a separate video, if a persistent connection is received and there's a persistence record, although this server is in a disabled state, the load balancer will still forward that connection back to Web01, wherein now it becomes an active connection. So it's very important to understand that because the server is placed into a disabled state does not mean that all connections are dropped or refused or ignored. And we can see that with current connections. So in a production environment, if we put the server into a disabled state, we'll actually be able to watch those current connections. But keep in mind with that persistence record that you may have zero connections and then have two or three when you hit the refresh button. Lastly, we want to move on to the forced offline state. The forced offline state, if we take a look at the brief description to the right, is only going to allow active connections. Now let's think about that and how that compares to disabled. If we take a look, only active connections. Let's think back to how that differs from disabled. On our disabled state, we allow persistent connections as well as active connections. If this server is placed into a forced offline state, those users that are actively browsing your site and have landed on Web01 will have their connection honored and the load balancer will continue to forward requests to Web01. A persistent connection that has a persistence record, that will not be honored and users that initiate a connection will actually be forwarded to a different server breaking that persistent connection. So now that we have each of those states defined, let's go see what it looks like in the GUI when we change states for our pool members. So I'll go ahead and move this server, this pool member, into a disabled state. 
and hit the update button. So now we can see that the availability has changed. It also records a timestamp of when that was actually disabled. And if I go back to our members tab, now we see that the icon has gone from green to a black circle. And one of the things that I really appreciate about the F5 is that if I need a reminder on what those states actually mean, I can just put my mouse right over and it gives me a real quick description. So the green circle tells us that this member is available, it's enabled, so the pool member is available for user requests. If I hover my mouse over the uh, Web01 pool member, I can see that it is available, however, it has been disabled by a user admin on the F5. Now one thing to keep in mind that if I change states of a pool member that is not across the F5 and is specific to the pool. Let's go ahead and take a look at our test pool as an example. So we can see here that Web01 and Web02 are each reporting available for their state. Now if I go back to our production, we'll see that Web01 is disabled in this pool. However, in the test pool, it is enabled. All right, so now that we've got Web01 disabled, let's go back in, re-enable the pool member, and then we'll take a look at the status when we force the pool member offline. Uh, so one real quick trick is if you didn't want to go back into the pool member specifically, you can always click the checkbox on the side here. And using the radio buttons down below, you can go ahead and quickly enable that pool member. So let's go ahead and jump back in. We'll go ahead and use Web01 again in our example. And we'll go ahead and force that server offline. Uh, something to note, we'll pay attention to this. Apply new state to all pool member instances. Um, we're gonna skip that for now, but we will come back around to that because it's really important. Uh, but so for right now, we force the server offline. We'll go ahead and update. And then one thing that you'll notice off the bat is previously the status was a black circle. Um, this has actually changed now to a black diamond. And if I hover over again, the F5 will give me that short reminder, that quick reminder on the uh, state that the pool member's in. So let's just verify that our test pool still shows both pool members as active because we have not modified Web01 at the node level, we've modified it at the pool level within pr the production pool. So we can take a look here and see that both pool members are active, they're enabled. Uh, if I go ahead and run back to the production pool, we'll see that we still have Web01 forced offline. All right, so let's go ahead and re-enable uh, the last time we did it, we used the shortcut, but let's go ahead and go back in. We'll go ahead and enable. And notice here that state option comes back again. So let's go ahead and enable. And we'll go ahead and force it offline. Now take a look at the state option. Now this will pop up when your pool member is configured in multiple pools using the same socket. So we can take a look before we do anything that in production, both Web01 and Web02 have uh, port 80 bound. And if I go back to the test pool, 
I'll see that web 01 and web 02 have 80 bound as well. So let's go back to production members, web 01. Let's go ahead and force this server offline and apply new state to all pool member instances. Let's see what happens. So if I go back to the members in the production pool, I'll see that web01 is forced offline. Remember, we have the diamond here, the black diamond. Now, if I go into the test pool and take a look at the members, I'll notice that now web01 is forced offline in both pools. So it's really important to remember that if you go in and make a change and click this state option, apply new state to all pool member instances, that is going to be a global change, but only when it's web01 as the node and the service port is the same. So let's go back to production. We should have both web01 and web02 enabled. So one remaining topic I wanted to go over is we've been enabling, disabling, and forcing offline at the pool level. But this is also configurable at the node level. At the node, we have the ability to use the radio buttons at the bottom and enable, disable, force offline, or delete a node as well as a pool member. Uh, but if we go into web01 and we go to force the server offline, notice how that state option doesn't pop up. And the reason why is because if I, any action that I take at the node level is propagated to each pool member, regardless of the service port. This is done at the IP level. So if I know that web01 is going to be rebooted, patched, um, or hardware maintenance may be performed on it, I'm gonna go ahead and disable that at the node level so I don't have to go into each pool and disable that service man that server manually. So let's go ahead and go back to the nodes. And an additional item to keep in mind is that a server, a physical or a VM may have more than one IP address assigned to it. So it's very important to understand that just because I disable web01 if I have multiple IP addresses assigned to that server, I'll need to make sure that I force each of those IPs offline. All right, now that does wrap up our video for today. If you have any questions, feel free to update them in the comments section below. Any suggestions, would love to hear from each and every one of you. Thanks, take care.